Hi, I'm Belinda Carley, the Director of the Institute of Personal Care Science. And today I'm going to talk to you about a very serious topic and that is cosmetic ingredient safety. I want to start by letting you know about a very, very dangerous substance that is in over 80% of your cosmetic products. In fact, it's so dangerous that it is fatal if inhaled. This very dangerous chemical you need to be careful of is water. Water is found in over 80% of your cosmetic and personal care products. It's perfectly fine when we drink two litres of it. It's perfectly safe when we bathe or swim in it, but it is fatal in even small quantities when you inhale it. It's this kind of irrationality that has affected the cosmetics industry and it's this kind of information I want to demystify today and tell you the truth about some of those potentially dangerous chemicals that you may find in your personal care products. Now the first chemical I want to talk to you seriously about are parabens. Now parabens were reported on in a journal that they could be leading to breast cancer in particular through the use of underarm deodorants. Well this particular report was not based on good scientific findings. There were several flaws with this particular study that the authors then came out and admitted after the fact. Now I am going to start by saying anything I say on this video you can contact us for a written report of what I'm saying and I will also provide you with links to where you can go and research the facts for yourself. So you don't just have to believe me, in fact just watch me and then go and do the investigations for yourself but I'll provide you with those links so you can make your own informed opinions by the end of this video. Back to this paraben report. So they found, the researchers found that there were an increased number of parabens in breast cancer tissue. They also made an assumption that because uh, deodorants are applied under the arm, the underarm has close proximity to breast tissue, they made the conclusion or the link uh, that application of underarm deodorants in, and the high increase of parabens in breast tissue, the two were related. Well, later on it was of course proven that the parabens applied to the underarm actually flowed away from the breast tissue and there were also no studies done to determine how many parabens are in healthy breast tissue. So there could be just as many parabens in healthy breast tissue as there is in tumour breast tissue. But of course that study hasn't been done so how can we d decide that uh, without any scientific evidence? It's also been found that there are more parabens in your food and of course they get ingested far more readily. So there's been uh, extensive research done by several regulatory authorities around the world to prove or disprove the safety of parabens in cosmetics since that report came out. And it has been conclusively proven that the amount of parabens used in personal care products, even cumulative totals from multiple cosmetic products used in any given day, will still be far below any levels that you may ingest or definitely far below any levels that may be of any sort of safety concern. Again, you can contact me for a full copy of this report and links to the scientific data that tells you exactly that. The next material I wanna to talk to you about is very widespread in the personal care industry and that is polyethylene glycol or substances where you see the inky name PEG. Now this substance is used to help make fatty substances more water loving. It can help uh, increase mildness in products, it can help make a lot of your vegetable oils more water loving to create them, uh, make them surfactants or emulsifying agents, even super fatting agents so that they can be washed away readily but still impart some conditioning properties. Now in the past the ethoxylation process did cause some residues of 1,4-dioxane. 1,4-dioxane is a dangerous chemical, there's no doubt about that, but there are two processing methods that can be used and in fact are used by the personal care industry to limit the impurities or amount of 1,4-dioxane that is present in your personal care raw materials and finished products. In fact, 1,4-dioxane is prohibited in any quantity in cosmetics according to EU cosmetic regulations. 
Further to this, and knowing it can occur as an impurity, the SCCS, which is the Scientific Committee on Consumer Safety, has determined that a safe level of less than 10 parts per million should be tested for and confirmed in all products that are ethoxylated. Again, this means that 1,4-dioxane is not present in your personal care at any sort of input above 10 parts per million. And that amount has been deemed as safe by the regulatory authorities when used in personal care, even in multiple products in a day. Again, if you would like a copy of this report and links to this particular information, please contact us. I'm happy to give them to you so that you can do your own research and find out the facts for yourself. Now let's talk about sodium lauryl sulfate and sodium laureth sulfate. First of all, both of these materials are highly effective anionic cleansing agents. In fact, they're used in multiple industries and I have seen reports on the internet where uh, their use as degreasers is pointed out. How can you use a substance for degreasing and then use it on your skin or your hair? The first thing I want to point out is the amount that gets used and how it gets used. Remember I started talking about how fatal water is if you inhale it? We can use a similar analogy here. Now in a personal care product, when used in a small amount, and they are generally used at 7% or less in a finished product, they're often companioned with mildness increasing agents, uh, which means that the end product is still highly effective but made much more mild than what you put on your industrial floor to clean it. The other thing I want to point out is that combinations of surfactants can dramatically not only improve cleansing and foaming, but also dramatically improve mildness. And that is what is done in your personal care products. Sodium lauryl sulfate and sodium laureth sulfate are used because they're highly effective foaming agents and they're relatively cheap to produce. Sodium lauryl sulfate has been used and still does get used in irritation studies because when used in high concentrations straight on the skin and not washed off, it is highly irritating. But again, I want to emphasize how the material is used in a personal care product. It is used in a small proportion in combination with other materials to increase its mildness and it is washed off thoroughly shortly after it is applied. Under these conditions, there is no reason to be concerned about using these chemicals on your hair or your skin, especially when rinsed off shortly after use. And it's incorrect of companies to suggest that the substance is being used in the same way as when it's applied for irritation studies, because it's not. The other thing that often gets mentioned about sodium lauryl sulfate is the potential for 1,4-dioxane uh, creation during its manufacture. And again, the same limits apply to 1,4-dioxane in cosmetic products, regardless of the cosmetic chemical that they may be found in during the production process. Remember, there are two different processing methods that manufacturers can use to reduce the amount of 1,4-dioxane produced during the chemical making process or to use to remove it at the end of the process. And in any case, remember 1,4-dioxane is prohibited in personal care products at a concentration above 10 parts per million. Again, being found that 10 parts per million is perfectly safe even in cumulative daily use in your personal care products. So again, the internet sites that suggest these products contain toxic or dangerous amounts of 1,4-dioxane are referring to either illegal products or not providing you with the full regulatory information. Next, let's talk about alkanol amines. Now, alkanol amines can be used to neutralize some fatty acids in the production of surfactants, such as cocamide DEA, for example. The problem with alkanol amines is that the final salt can be turned into nitrous amines, and nitrous amines are known as potentially cancer-causing chemicals. But again, the amount of residual nitrosamine that can form from a compliant cosmetic ingredient 
has been deemed within regulations to be safe as used. Under EU cosmetics regulation in Annex 3, entry 60 to 62 inclusive, this limits the maximum secondary amine content of all fatty acid dialkylol amides, monoalkanol amines and trialkanol amines and their salts to 0.5% which means cosmetic ingredient suppliers complying with these limits are ensuring your safe use of the personal care product where that material is found. Now where they don't comply, they are providing the industry with an illegal or impure substance and we've seen multiple recalls occur where authorities find impurities, contaminants or other issues with personal care products. But that is not a fault of the ingredients or the regulations, that is when people are simply breaking the law. I've also seen on the internet that propylene glycol is toxic to my health because it's closely related to ethylene glycol. Again, I wanna point out that these are different substances. There is nothing wrong with using propylene glycol in personal care. It's a humectant and it's got such a good safety profile, there are no limitations on its use. Just because a substance has a similar name to another chemical that may be an issue, we should not be treating that substance as if it is the same, because molecularly, they're not. Finally, I sometimes get people that say to me, well, what if the regulators aren't getting it right? I would like to point out that the same governments that oversee the regulatory authorities are the same governments that invest billions every year into cancer research and life-saving treatments. So I would put to you, why would these authorities want to risk your health if they're then spending billions to try and save it? Instead, those rules are put in place to make sure that companies comply and ensure safety and certainty in the personal care products you use every day. If there is ever an issue, just like when that journal came out suggesting there was a safety issue with parabens and breast cancer, multiple regulatory agencies from around the world jumped onto the research to investigate is there actually a potential safety issue here and they all distinctly disproved that journal article and any potential risks when used in personal care products. It's the regulator's responsibility to make sure those limits are in place to ensure safe use of cosmetic chemicals. It's a company's responsibility to make sure that the products they put on the market comply with those regulations and contain pure chemicals to make sure they comply with the regulations to ensure your safety. And it's cosmetic chemical suppliers also bound by these regulations to make sure the products you use are safe when used as directed. And again, if we see impurities or contamination, recalls are quick to happen. And where someone simply breaks the law, their products are removed from the marketplace and they wear severe penalties for it. So please go back to enjoying your personal care, knowing that your products when formulated within regulatory limits are safe when used as directed. And please continue to swim because water is a lot of fun, just don't inhale it. Happy formulating.